I yawn in the middle of this, it's because I know I'm boring. Um, no, it's because I've been up all night. I have a one-year-old. Um, and so, um, so it, if that happens, I hope it doesn't. Um, the other thing is, is that I want to share with you a little bit of my journey that I think leads me here. Because I think I need to premise what I'm going to say. Because if I don't, I don't think it's going to make much sense, to be completely honest. So, um, as Nerdin said, I used to be very involved um, on a practical level inside ministries with music and bands. I'm involved in worship. I ended up running worship for our church for a while. I was a deacon. And over the last sort of, I would say, six or seven, probably close to ten years, I've slowly been stepping out of leadership roles within church um, and finding myself more within leadership roles and driving roles within business. And I've always wondered why that was taking place. And then last year, um, I started getting these invitations to these Christian conferences, which I thought was rather hilarious because it could have been seen quite simply that I had given up my soul to run for business. And I feel a very personal um, a very personal aspect of my life is that I'm called to the work that I do at Digit Lab. I'm called to the work that I do in another business called Brave Narrative. And, um, and it's quite strange in business to feel like you're called to do something which you don't really see the impact directly within a church body. And I've been grappling with this for quite some time. And getting these invitations um, I was asked to speak at the Global Leadership Summit in Swaziland last year, and around the same time, um, Nerdin got in touch and asked if I would speak at this conference. And the reason that I've taken the opportunity to speak here is because I just believe that everybody needs to hear what I'm going to share with you. But more so than that, from a church perspective, from a Christian perspective, from a media publishing perspective in our industry as Christians, we're falling behind. And I then parallel that with this journey that goes on my, in my mind, and, this, uh, and it's a little bit um, frustrating that we had an apologetic speaker before me, because I'm going to share some of you, uh, with, with you some of my sort of flawed theology. And it sits something like this. I believe that God is extraordinary. Would you agree with that? And I believe that we're made in his image. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Now, surely that means we should live extraordinary lives. Yeah. Okay, that's the bit I made up. You can disagree with that if, you, if you'd like. But that's the way I see it. I see that our lives need to be extraordinary. That as Christians, we should be leading the charge on all the things that are taking place in this world. As we move into the future, it's a future that's been defined by man who is made in God's image. So we should be leading the charge in all of these things. And, um, and I find it amazing that there are so many Christian business leaders out there that are doing phenomenal stuff that have vision like I've never seen before. Yet the people who represent the Christian bodies don't. They, they, they find themselves locked in some sort of struggled mentality that I just don't understand. And, um, and so I think my job here today is to try and unlock a bit of what the thinking is that goes into digital. And I hope it's a challenge because technology is not your competitive edge in business. People think it is. It's not your competitive edge. It's your accelerating pedal. So if you want to take your message and get it out into the world, if you want to play a global play, if you want to impact as many lives as possible, if you want to influence people like you've never influenced them before, technology is the mechanism that you will do that at speed and at scale and at pace like you can never imagine. Amen. And that's what I'm hoping that we can unlock and we can start to think about today. So with that as a premise... I'm then going to launch into a big business presentation, if that's okay. Um, and I want to talk about these things because they are very important to me and the way that I view the world. And it really centers around this idea that technology is about being human-centric. And I will build, build into this more. If you're on Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn or any platform, you can catch me on that handle. Please do talk to me. 
have conversations. It's the best way to get free consulting from me, just because I get bored and lonely, and I love to uh, talk to people. So um, that, that will be great fun if you can. Uh, follow and chat. If you do take photos, please just tweet them back. I'd love to be able to use them for um, my marketing further, and I will credit you. So now that that's out the way, let me tell you a story. Anybody here own a iPhone? That guy's got two hands in the air. Do you have two phones, or just you're just that excited about it? Just okay. Cool. Um, is it a recent purchase? If you just migrated to the good side. Um, <laughs> How many, how many people own a, an Android phone? Okay. <laughs> how many people own a Blackberry? Yeah, you, like, do you use it every day? Or it's just like in the museum shelf? Like, it's, it's it? For traveling. So that's the one you don't mind breaking. Okay, now that's cool. I understand that. Anyone else with a, with a Blackberry? I didn't see you. One or two others. So let's say eight years ago, a smartphone was a BlackBerry. That's what it was. And the iPhone didn't exist. Android had just been put onto the market, and they were still trying to figure things out. And what they were doing was replicating what they had seen in the BlackBerry space. What happened? Well, BlackBerry was run by two CEOs at the time. One was the front-facing CEO, did all the press and the coverage and all of that stuff. And the other guy was more like a chief operations officer, but he, he co-led the team in that respect. And he was involved in the technology conversations and driving the technology forward. And he was convinced that the next way to improve technology from a cell phone point of view was to get the best quality audio out of your device. I don't know how many of you have been incredibly frustrated that you can't hear someone on the other end of the phone. BlackBerry hoped that they would solve that. It was flawed in a very big way because just share the reason we can't often hear people is because we are either in load shedding or um, having um, sort of t technical difficulties with our network suppliers. But I think the thing is, is that their, their focus on technology had no hu real human benefit. Okay. There's no real human benefit to better quality audio on a cell phone. Apple, at the same time as BlackBerry are releasing the highest technology available on the planet inside a mobile phone, they're bringing out 3G because it wasn't around anymore at the time. Apple releases a 2G phone and it revolutionizes the smartphone industry. Why? because they built an app store that lets you download Facebook. It lets you customize your phone. Your iPhone looks completely different to mine. Mine stresses people out, apparently. I have so many apps, I can't keep up with the downloads, all the notifications, because I love apps, and I'm always testing and using and f trying to figure stuff out. I'm basically like a crack cocaine addict, at it, <laughs> but with apps. And, um, and so my phone would stress people out, but it's fine for me, and your phone will look different even though it's the same phone, because you've built it around who you are. And you can do that. And the thing is, is that what we need to understand about this is that the reason, the fundamental reason, at the end of the day, why Apple beat everybody in the race on smartphones is they built phones people like to use. It's that simple. The best technology is the technology people use. Not the technology that impresses people the same as whatever. Like, it doesn't matter that we're going to get the best, fastest internet speeds into our country at some point in the future, maybe, if we're lucky. What matters is that we can get that out to the masses of people that they can actually use it. Because it's only then that you get the benefit of it. It's only then that you can build business models around this. It's only then that when people use things that we actually add value to people's lives. Okay, And so this is a very clear case example <coughs> that digital is not a technology conversation. It's a people conversation. This entire game that we play is about people. The reason you want to know more about social media and mobile applications and technology is because your people have disappeared into that world and you don't know how to find them. It's a people game. 
It's not a technology game. And that fundamental shift is an important one to understand. Technology fails, in my opinion, when it fails to add convenience, efficiency, ego, or entertainment value to the lives of people. These are the four things that I've found. Convenience, efficiency, ego, and entertainment. If you have others, please let me know, because I'm trying to add to this list, because the longer the list, the smarter I seem. Um, so if you have others, please, but this is the best that I've got so far, is that every time you either make people's lives more convenient, more efficient, you make them their status grow within them in some way, or you entertain them, those seem to be the best uh, performing products and services and content in the digital space right now. So I want to share this. This is a very young version of Steve Jobs. Um, and I do think that he had one of the most forward-thinking minds, but he has such a beautiful, simple way of explaining why technology is important today. I remember... Uh reading an article when I was about 12 years old, I think it might have been in Scientific American, where they measured the efficiency of locomotion for all these species on planet Earth. Uh, how many kilocalories did they expend to get from point A to point B? And the condor one uh, came in at the top of the list, uh, surpassed everything else, and humans came in about a third of the way down the list, which was not such a great showing for the crown of creation. And, uh, but somebody there had the imagination to test the efficiency of a human riding a bicycle. Human riding a bicycle blew away the condor, all the way off the top of the list. And it, it made a really big impression on me that we humans are tool builders and that we can fashion tools that amplify these inherent abilities that we have to spectacular magnitudes. And so for me, a computer has always been a bicycle of the mind, uh, something that, that takes us far beyond our inherent abilities. And uh, I think we're just at the early stages of this tool, very early stages, and we've come only a very short distance, and it's still in its formation, but already we've seen enormous changes. I think that's nothing compared to what's coming in the next 100 years. Computer is the bicycle for the mind. It's the tool that helps us move faster. What I love about this is that we can get tools and, uh, and, and technology to do the mundane stuff that we don't want to do anymore so that we can actually focus on the thinking work. In the academic space, there, there are thought leaders that are saying that if we don't teach our children how to problem solve and be creative, if we don't develop that side of the mind, they have no future. Because the future of being in a, in a position where we're just going to be, have a whole pile of people there doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, that's going to not exist in the future. And so right now, we should be developing problem-solving capabilities within our kids in school and not worry about the how to do things and following process and the industrialized nature of things. And why do we think like that? Why, is, why are people saying that? Because it doesn't matter anymore that we run industrialized processes because computers have stepped in. They pick up that piece. They become the bicycle of our mind so that we can spend the time and energy on the right things that we want to do. So problem solving, I think, is going to become a very key thing to the point that my entire business at Digital Lab is built around solving business problems with technology. That's it. That's all we do. Um, so technology, in my opinion, unlocks human potential. So here's an interesting story. Anybody been on, on a jet ski before? Anyone been surfing? OK. Um, anyone who's been surfing, have you tried a big wave, like those proper beast waves? You know, the ones that basically just scare you and ruin your pants. Um, those ones, okay. Now, the thing is, is that when they started surfing those waves, they didn't know how to get onto them, so they got jet skis to pull them up and, they, and basically load them onto the wave and then they could ride the wave. They couldn't ride the wave without the help of that technology. Except today, they know how to mount the wave. They don't use the jet skis. The jet skis aren't there to help them get on the wave. The jet skis are there to help them when they die, when the, the, when the wave lands on them. It's a, it's a great sport. Um, but, but I think the, the, um, the thing that we need to realize is that in that case, the human being had no idea that they were capable of mounting the wave. They use technology to jump, to hurt, hurdle to the next step. And then when they're now playing in that space, they realize they have the capacity and the potential to mount the wave themselves. 
So technology is that thing that pushes us further, that helps us realize what our actual human potential is about, that we're no longer industrial mechanisms that have to now sit there and watch the channel, uh, watch the, the production line move through. Machines can do that. We can repair the machines. We can manage the machines. We can make decisions for the machines, et cetera. And we, and we improve our human potential in that respect. And this is the scary thing, is, is that technology is embedded, embedded in everything we do, from your email account, which seems like the least technologically driven thing on the planet, but it was the, one of the most forward-thinking pieces of technology at the time. PayPal, which is one of the biggest um, businesses at its time, was using um, emails to run transactions, which seems so rudimentary right now, but it was mind-blowing back then. And the concept of email is really a huge technology breakthrough, and for us, we just do it every day. Some of us are so addicted to this that you've checked your email three or four times in the, while I've actually started the presentation. You've at least looked at your phone to see the notifications come through. The other thing that, that so there's email, then the way in which we use phones is completely different. Um, a friend of mine has a, um, has a, at the time, had a two-year-old child, a little boy, and he's running around with a shoe, and he's pretending like it's a phone. And you, we've seen children do this. They run around with the, 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 the shoe on them, and they're like, hello, Granny. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. And they do this. But he wasn't holding it up against his face. He was holding it in front of it and pushing buttons. He was taking photos. Because that's what parents do with their phones. We don't pick up the phone anymore and talk on it, unless it's our mother-in-law, and even then I try to avoid it. Um, <clears throat> but, but that's the only time we really do that. We're either sitting, pressing buttons on our phone, or taking photos with it. So kids running around pretending they're on the phone is a completely different experience. We do different things with our devices, and this has become the norm. This is our digital camera. We don't carry other cameras with us anymore because this is all we need. And we take more photos than the professional <laughs> photographers do themselves. And we take it of one subject, and it's our child. <laughs> That's all we take photos of, our children. And uh, maybe if you've got a hot wife, possibly. But that's kind of where it ends. <laughs> but then technology is moving into the space, which is just so mind-blowing. They're, they're bringing this idea of nanotechnology into play. This is Sony's, one of Sony's latest patents. It's a, it's, a capture, it's a camera inside a contact lens. So, I mean, can you imagine the next time you get into a car accident, you just blink like 17 times or whatever it takes to activate it, and then it's just going to record everything that takes place. It's a pretty cool piece of software, and this is going to become the norm. The other types of things they're doing with contact lenses is that they're using it to, to help diabetics understand what their blood sugar level is like, my dad, which is something that's quite close to me. My dad died of diabetes. But his, and, and watching that, that sugar level is so important. So what they do is they, tint, they, they, can, um, they can measure your sugar levels with um, the stuff around your eyeball, that water whatever that is. You can tell I've got a degree in medicine as well. Um, <coughs> and, and because they can measure that, they then tint the contact lens based on the sugar level. So it goes blue when you're down, and it goes red when you're up. So the world looks rosy when your sugar, sugar level is too high, and the world looks normal when it's perfect, and it looks blue when you should actually sort something out. These things are incredibly valuable pieces of technology that will do incredible things, and it's becoming ubiquitous in the way we're doing things. Because if I said to you that the highest piece of technology you may be wearing in the future, you would probably say it's your watch. But most likely, it's going to be your contact lenses. And this is the thing, is, is that it's embedded with everything around us. So this is how I'm going to share a little bit of a story. So I, I used to believe this, that there were four disruptive forces Okay, that impacted every single piece of technology and its development going forward. And the first was social. Not social media as in the platform of Facebook, but the fact that we can connect with people and build relationship online. That was that disruptive force. Okay? The second one was data. Not the fact that we can collect all the stuff and put it in data warehouses, but the fact that I can use data to understand people. Okay? That was the other disruptive force. Then, I used to, then we added... 
Oh, I'm getting excited here. It's a problem. If I trip on this, please take a photo. It'll be hilarious. Um, but um, the next one is mobile. And it's, again, not about the device, but the fact that we can meet people in the context of in which they live. So I can send you messages as you're buying my product. I can, I can put all my content reviews of the products that I'm selling online so that while you're standing in the Mr. Price store trying to work out if that's the best jacket to buy right now, you can do the full um, product evaluation in the store. They've even got chairs that you can sit on that allow you to re be relaxed while you go and search competitive products. I've done this. I walked into exclusive books the one day and, uh, and I found a book that I liked. Exclusive books sold me a book, except I didn't buy it from them. I scanned the ISBN number, found it cheaper on Kindle, downloaded it onto my Kindle, went next door to Fago, sat down and had a cup of coffee and, bought my, and read my new book. Fago made more money off me that day than an exclusive books who put all the energy in, in the retail space and the marketing and everything to get me into that store. And so the context in which we connect with people is different, and that's what mobile speaks to. Cloud is this concept that all the data and everything we're doing is no longer sitting on physical stuff, but it's now sitting in the cloud. Okay? The simplest way to, do, to explain that is that it's a server with everything that was on the ground that's now sitting on the ground somewhere else, but it's backed up 1,700 times. So it essentially is virtually in the cloud, and it will never disappear. Okay? So that's what the cloud is. And the beauty of the cloud is, is that it allows us to deploy and think and move quicker than we've ever done before. In 16 days, Elon Musk received a tweet that said, it's terrible that your Tesla vehicles can't use the petrol stations with the charging stations that you've got because people charge their cars and go and sit in the coffee shop for an hour next door and they leave their car on the charging panel, and so we can't get all the cars through. And that was a tweet that went out. Someone said, hey, you, you should probably look at this problem. Within 16 days, they sat down as an executive, came up with a solution, issued it through their cloud platform, dro dropped it down to every single one of their, t um, their um, charging stations, reprogrammed the software, that for every minute your car was on the platform, after it was char fully charged, you got charged more. 16 days to roll out, re-strategize, reprogram every single charging station across the globe. It's mind-blowing. That's what cloud brings to the table. And I used to think it was these four, and then this e-commerce thing came into play. And I liked four, because that was simple, and I used to speak at presentations, it'd be like, simple, it's nice, it's four. And then this e-commerce thing started eating at us, and we started realizing that's another disruptive force. And then we found that the Internet of Things was another disruptive force. So if you think about the fact that you can connect with all these people online, the Internet of Things just says that you can connect with things now online. I can talk to that computer. I can use Twitter to, to speak to automated bots. I can do all of these different things. I'm not speaking to a human being. I'm speaking to a machine. And they're creating all of this stuff. So now that's a whole new thing that we now need to consider. And it's another disruptive force. And now my whole framework that I literally lived by is now being destroyed slowly. And then they threw blockchain into that as well. And I was, thanks, guys. This is completely messing me up. And blockchain, does anybody understand what blockchain is? Okay, just blockchain sits on this idea of a distributed ledger. And so it works like this. Can, can I ask you just to lend me your phone? Okay, so for the sake of it, I'm going to say he's given me this phone. You've all, someone's phoning you. No, it's fine. Are you sure? No, no, it's fine. You know what, I, I, no. can, I can answer it for you. No. You know, okay. <laughs> I'm just telling me unavailable. That's, that's cool. Um, Mom? Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. So what ends up happening is, is that you've now given me this phone. And every single one of you have seen him give me this phone. Which means, if he contests, it contests the fact that I, he gave me this phone, all of you are telling me that, no, he gave it to you. We saw it take place. So it doesn't matter. He would have to be on like the ultimate political drive to convince all of you that he didn't give me the phone in order for me to reverse that transaction. And that's what distributed ledger is in its very simple, simple form, is the fact that when you make a transaction, it's recorded in so many different places by so many different people and, and objects that it cannot be fraudulent. And that's why the financial institutions should be it. 
And that's why we should never, in my opinion, ever have to go to a voting station ever again. Because we should be able to do it via blockchain through now. Um, but we can't yet. We'll get there one day, maybe before we die. Um, but what I'm getting at is, is that this now whole thing is a, brings a whole new dynamic to technology that we've never experienced before. And my philosophy of these four disruptive forces that govern everything got destroyed. I even tried to fit them in and I got pretty close, but it became very, very complex. And so I re-looked at all of this and I started to realize something. The internet is everywhere. It's just not everywhere in the same way. And why is that? The technology is the same. You've got access to all the same things. Why is that? It's because of human beings. It's the way in which we use the internet, it's the way in which we use technology that makes it different. The technology itself isn't different. It's the way in which we use it. Has anybody ever You've got those black bags sitting at home that you put your rubbish in. What is the best use of a black bag? It's, to, it's a raincoat. In my opinion, it's a kite. Because my dad used to build the most epic kites out of black bags and dowling rods. And we used to go out and fly those things all the time. That is the best use. It's way more fun than just filling it with rubbish and hanging, sending it outside, the, outside my house. It's, it's, a rain, it's a raincoat. It's how we use the thing that makes it valuable. The thing is the same thing at the end of the day. And so if you look in Africa, they use the internet a completely different way to what we do. If you look in South Africa, at different pockets of South Africa, they use the internet completely differently. Their view of the internet is completely different. Some people only ever see the internet through a dumb phone. And some people see it through smart screens and fancy different devices and rich media technology. Everybody sees it differently and it's based on the way, on, on who's around them, the situation they find themselves, and that's a key thing to understand here is the human context, the humanness of who we are, dictates how we use this technology. So there's a big, big need for anthropology in the digital space. Um, many um, marketing consultancies are hiring anthropologists because they need to understand human behavior in order to get adoption of technology right. And, and it's, an, it's a really interesting concept. So how do we start to build consumer-centric content or products for the digital world. So I, as I said, I went down this journey. I, I had my whole uh, theory base, uh, literally the last six and a half years of me speaking at conferences is a complete waste of time. I've shared things that don't make sense to people, and now I'm trying again. And so if we look at this, I've now got it down to three things, context, relationship, and intelligence. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we can do, go through this. I'm going to share some examples of how this becomes real. And I'm hoping that when you leave this place, you will go back into your marketing plans, you'll go back into your business plans, and you will say, what's changed in the context of my consumer? What's changed in the, concept, the context of my business? What's changed in the relationship that my customer has with their community? What's changed with the relationship that I have with my customer? And intelligence in the same way. So let's jump into context. Before I do this, are you with me? Yes. Are we there? Are we, you don't need to do amens. It's not one of those. But it's um, you with me. OK, cool. So this is how I define context. Senses and devices that we have on us and on the things we use paint a picture of where, you, where we are as, in, as, as individuals. They paint a picture of your customer. The fact that they use an application and there's a location based on that says we now know not just that you're using the app, but that you're using the app in the city. If you scan a QR code, I can now go, I now know that you're not only in the city, but you're in my shopping center and you're looking for more information. And because of the place where you scanned that, I probably know what type of information you're looking for. And so all of these senses surround us, the 
sensors inside the contact lenses all the way through to what emails you send across your Gmail account. All of these things are data points that are being measured that allow us as businesses and as media partners to understand the context of our people and it allows them to unknowingly or knowingly share that information with you. So do you know, you know the privacy debate? Every time Facebook changes their privacy statement, everyone gets upset for at least seven hours, and then we all just carry on using Facebook. But do you know that Google has done more in the privacy infringement space um, than, than anyone knows? The only difference was Facebook asked permission. They said, we want to do this, and, and they set up this infrastructure that they kind of had to because it was moral and what, what, what. If I walked over to your house this afternoon and started taking photos of the front of your house for fun, what would you do? Some of you would call the police. Um, some of you would get really upset about it. Close the curtains, maybe. There's huge, um, one of the best Google searches you can ever do is just look for mistakes and funny things they've found taking Google photos of people's houses. It's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious what, you could, what they've been able to find. They've got the most weird, compromising things that have taken place that they've got photographs of, and then they just put it up online for the whole world to see. And then they integrated it into search. You know the one website where everybody goes? They put all your photos there to easily find. People can find you because they know what your face looks like on Facebook. They can find your house because they know what it looks like now. Google didn't ask permission, so nobody got upset about it. And then when they did get upset about it and they said something, they said, no, it's cool, we'll take all the photos down. No, 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 I like Google Street View. Please don't take it away. Because we would rather trade the convenience for our privacy for the convenience of these things rather than actually not have them in our world. And this is a really interesting thing about context is that as consumers, we want our brands and our customers and our, the, the companies we work with to understand our context. Why? Because we want you to either entertain us better, we want you to uh, make our lives more convenient, more efficient, we want you to build our ego. We want you to make, look, make us look good in front of other people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what context is. It's all of these sensors and devices around the place that are painting a picture of who we are. It's about the physical person. And it works like this. <coughs> that's a cloud. If you can't work out my beautiful artistry, that's a cloud. Um, and um, what's happening is, is that that cloud is sending and receiving information backwards and forwards from your computer, from your mobile phone, from your tablet, from all of these devices that you have. It's doing it possibly directly to your watch, but most likely from your watch to your phone up to the cloud. It's doing it with other devices that people are using over and over again for all of these things that are taking place. Now, we've, we know that it's tracking that stuff and it can use that stuff, but it's also using sensors to be able to understand what's going on in the world from a, a things point of view. Remember that comment I made about the Internet of Things, about the fact that you cannot connect things to the Internet? In fact, there are more things connected to the Internet than there are people now. Okay? The, 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 the big challenge here is, is that historically, all the data on the Internet was put there by a human being, which means you had to sit down and actually do it, which took time and energy, and it's, an, and it's a finite resource. Now, you've got machines sending information every split second um, to, to servers all the time. And so uh, the, the amount of information that's on the internet is very close to support, uh, for that have been put there by machines is very close to surpassing the amount of information that have been put there by human beings. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this space is that this is one of the most valuable opportunities we have. As, as a human being. If you know, and the example I'll give you is, um, <coughs> is this, blood fridges that store blood. Okay, not for vampires, for hospitals. Um, but those, those fridges, if the, if the temperature of blood rises by a degree or drops by a degree, it's off. And the way they test that is every 15 minutes, a nursing sister grabs her clipboard 
and walks over to the fridge and checks the temperature and goes, it's fine. Clipboard down and off they go. That's how we manage this. I don't know about you, but if the temperature dropped and went up, I don't want the blood anymore. Even if you said it was great, I just, I don't want it, you know? Now what they're doing is, is they're saying, no, cool, we can put a sensor on the fridge and we can monitor that in real time every split second. And every time the temperature goes up too high, we can actually send a signal back to the thermostat to say, drop the temperature. And then we can do the other. So we can send signals backwards and forwards to the fridge and the cloud. Cloud does the computer stuff and then sends, it, sends the information back down and the thermometer just goes up and down as it needs to by the split second. I don't know about you, but next time someone offers me blood, I'm gonna like, has it got a sensor in the fridge and is it connected to the internet? Because I don't wanna trust any other system at the moment, you know? Um, because that's, that's important and it's gonna do wonders to what we're doing. Um, I, read, uh, I, read a, I, read, I saw a really interesting video that they've now put keyboards into fabric. So they've got all that technology down to a point that you can now have a piece of fabric in front of your computer and you can type away which is pretty cool, okay? However, I've got a one-year-old and a seven-year-old and I'm very nervous that one day he's going to be standing in my living room having a text conversation with his girlfriend doing this. <laughs> and I'm just not ready for that visual. I just, I'm just really not ready for it. It's just, there's something about it is, as excited as I am about the technology world changing our future, there's something about that moment that just doesn't do it. And the cloud connects you to people. And the cloud will connect you from people to devices, devices to people, things to people, people to things, and it will connect everything together. They call it the connection economy because it's the level of connections that we have that are going to make us really valuable in the future. Sorry, I get really excited and you're gonna, I hope you don't want lunch because um, I'm gonna speak through it. <coughs> so what does this mean in media? I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So historically we built communities in TV, radio and print. Now your communities live somewhere else. I'm not saying they don't live there, but they're also in community apps like Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram and Snapchat. They're in messaging apps. They're in networks, online games. So do you know that there are more than 10 million people around the world who play online pool on their phone? 10 million people. It's a mind blowing, and that's not even like one of the big games on the internet. Um, and so there, there are all these new communities that we're not engaging because we're not going, what is the context in which my, my customer finds themselves, the people that I'm talking to find themselves, and how do I share my message with them effectively? Um, so those are the, the key things. Income streams have changed. So I don't know if you've noticed recently, but all of a sudden, everybody's coming to South Africa for a tour and a this and a that. We can buy tickets for stuff every month. And it's because of the fact that people download music for free. And the reason is, is because there's no value in music before. In 98, I believe it was, J. Lo was a world, worldwide international pop star. And she had a poster in LA that went up that said her first live performance. Because you could get the coverage and you could earn the income just by releasing the music and getting the radio play and doing that. You can't do that anymore. That supports the brand that pulls the people to the events. The highest grossing bands, uh, the highest grossing band last year was U2. They were on tour. And what, what album were they playing? They literally went and replayed the Joshua Tree album from beginning to end. That's what they did. Because you can't make money from people listening to music anymore. You make money from people standing in the experience that you've created. Um, Coldplay, um, who's vis visible here, they've got a guy that they call the fifth mem member of the band. He's not in the band, you don't know about him, but his job is to create live stadium experiences. And they treat him like a band member because that's what's changed. In, nine, in, in the year 2000, Madonna dropped her record label in favor for an event company because this income streams shifted. And so we have to shift with it. How many of you are struggling to work out where the income streams are? Technology provides a whole new world of income streams that we're just not aware of. 
and they're, and they're forcing us to make those changes. Our consumers, the other one, is that our consumers dual screen. So this is Velcro. This is what the human brain works like now. Can anybody tell me their home phone number? Can you tell me your home phone number when you were 13? Because we had to learn it. What, how do I get in touch with you? Uh, 031-764-5461. I don't live there anymore. You can phone it. Um, <laughs> but that's the number. I don't know my wife's cell phone number. And people said to me, that's terrible. You better learn it because I bet you she knows yours. So I went home. And I said, Ange, do, do you know my cell phone number? She's like, no. So I said, because, and then I told the story. Now she knows it. But the reason she knows it is because the first six digits are the code to get into my phone. So that's why she knows it, the first six digits. She just had to learn the other four. So what I'm getting at here is, is that all of this changes the way in which the human brain works. We no longer retain information. If you want to test this, play Trivial Pursuit without your phone. It's the boringest game you will ever play because guys will go, yeah, when did so-and-so... Mm. Who's so-and-so? Like, we don't know stuff because we know that if we need to know that stuff, we go to Wikipedia or we go to Google. So, so what we do now is we retain hooks to where the information is. Okay? So our brains are roughly the same size, but we're able to do so much more with it because we're not really spending time retaining information. We're, we're connecting the dots. And we say, oh, I, I, you don't know when your best friend's birthday is, but you've got Facebook to tell you when it's coming, so you don't need to worry about it. Okay, and that's the stuff. We don't need to know it and remember it anymore. We just need to have the links into the place. And so our brain is the, the, the sticky side of Velcro. And the messages and all the information that we're trying to access is that furry side on the top that connects in. And as media broadcasters, what we need to start to do to be able to influence change and, and to get people to hear our message is that we need to get as many of those little furry things attached to the brain. And we can't do that through one channel because people aren't doing that. And then just think of it like this. That's not even a very strong little hook on their brain because they're not even focused on what you're saying because they're busy on their phone while they're doing it. They're driving while they're listening to your radio station. They're uh, reading up. On, they're, they're on social media while they're watching your TV program. They're, they're doing other stuff. So that's the flimsiest hook you've ever tried. To, have you ever tried to play that game in the arcade center where you had to find the bear and like pull it? That's what you're playing with in a person's brain now because we've got so many things to be able to connect with in the way in which humans are adapting for this reason. The other thing is that your distribution channels have moved. The way in which you've got your stuff in front of people is different. They access online stores, podcasts, YouTube, subscription media services, app stores, torrents. <coughs> torrents are one of the biggest download pieces on the planet at the moment. And that's where they're going to get all of your media or your competitors' media or something. But they're not coming through the channels that you wish they would come to. So rethink your distribution strategies because their context has changed. I have got very excited, so I'm going to move through these next two. But this next one's about relationship. And it's the relationship that you have and the network you find yourself into. So technology connects us to more networks of people. In, one, in my book, Renowned, I speak about this idea that um, as marketers and as people who build personal brand, we, um, the, the value of the acquaintance is becoming more and more valuable because they're the, they're the people we don't have to maintain the relationship, but they can maintain it with us. It's that one-way conversation. And that acquaintance is becoming very valuable to us because of the size of networks and what we're capable of managing. Dating has changed. I don't know if any of you have done this. I dated and got married when I was quite young, and then we took different paths, and so I found myself in, a, uh, in the dating world again. And when I first started dating, we used to do things like ask them on a date and, and like take them for coffee and, and get to know each other. Now, when I then stepped into the dating world again, and I met this beautiful girl who was six years younger than me, I thought I'd be okay. I was wrong. You start, we saw each other in a room, and it was like bliss. And then it ended. 
And I was like, what, what happens now? And then we connected on Facebook, which was scary because my son from my previous marriage was holding my hand in the photo. And I was like, oh, this, like you don't lead with that on your first, hi, I've got 17 children from different mothers. Like, that, you don't lead with that when you're trying to meet a new person, you know? And so, so now I'm like, there's this debate going on in my head, and anyway, so we do this Facebook thing, and then she connects and she sees, and she, before I went on my first date, she had already had a conversation with her parents about whether or not she could love my child. Because all that information is out there. The stuff you would talk about on your second, third, and fourth date is being dealt with before you even get the date in the first place. <laughs> on my second date, my wife, she's now my wife, my wife said to me, um, you've been divorced, why would you want to get married again? And I had to give this like really strong opinion about how I still love marriage and I had to have like opinion on date two. We're supposed to be talking about like what ice cream we like. Like that's what we, but because the way that communication has shifted and what we put out there is different, we, we've just bypassed all these steps, okay? And now what's interesting about that is in business, 60% of the purchase decision is made before you step in the room. You've been shortlisted, discussed, managed, put in, and now you're on the shortlist. Now they're ready to talk to you. And they already know what they want to talk about. You're not there to pitch your product. You're there to convince them that they need you. So the, the, everything's shifted in this respect. The way in which we do relationships, the way in which we communicate is shifted. And so our online presence becomes something valuable because of what we're putting out there. And that's what I speak about a lot in, in that renowned book. But the, the key here is this. Trust is the currency of relationship. A weak relationship, weak trust. Good relationship, great trust. And these brilliant guys at the Trusted Advisors business that they have, wrote this equation. Credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation equals trust. And I've tested this many times. Just quickly, write on a piece of paper in front of you a brand you trust. <coughs> Anyone? It's a class participation exercise. <laughs> now score it on a scale of one to 10. How credible is it to you? Not how credible is it to everybody else. How credible is it to you? Scale of 1 to 10, 10 being most credible. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the most reliable, how reliable is that brand to you? How reliable? Reliable is about how they deliver their product or service to you. Then, how intimate to you? Now, people struggle with the word intimate when we talk about brands, but it's more a case of how do you feel that there's some sort of relationship, like this person cares about you, that this brand gets you. You have a feeling of the, that they get you, that they know you. That's scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the, the most intimate. Okay. Now, self, then you divide by self-orientation. So on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the most self-orientated, Sorry, 10 being the most self-orientated, okay? On that scale, how much do you feel they're out for themselves versus out for you? Add those numbers up, divide it by your self-orientation, and you get a trust score out of 10. So 10 would be for themselves. And one 10 would be for themselves. Okay. And you get a number. And what you'll see is that you're generally scoring quite high on those, and then if your self-orientation is low, you generally feel a lot more trust. And the easiest way to explain that is no one has ever walked out of a date doing, going, do you know what I really loved about that person was that they never stopped talking about themselves. I just love that level of just, you know, audacity. It's just so sexy. Like, that's not what we do, you know? So, but now, let me just ask you, let's put ESCOM on, on this. <laughs> Okay. How credible, how reliable, how intimate. Someone in a conference once said to me, you feel very intimate when the lights go out. Um, <laughs> and how self-orientated are, are they? And you start to see how those two justifications actually bring a level of trust. And so this is a really strong way and a really easy way to start to measure how people perceive their trust in you as a company and what you're able to do. And if you're in media and people don't trust you, you cannot influence anything. And if you're in Christian media and you're trying to change the way people live, you cannot influence that if you don't have trust in that way.
And so this equation really helps you to be able to build that out. And so when we look at relationship in the media space, I can share this example. The, the, the influx of fake news into this space has created such a level of, uh, um, uh, it, it is, it has decreased the value of cred credibility within the news space, that if you want to be a credible news source, you have to spend a lot of time trying to prove that you're credible. And you have to be very careful about what you put out there because there's so much fake news out there and it's shifting perceptions easily. I was in Johannesburg last year when Durban had, when KZN had these massive floods and they were showing me all these videos of stuff that had happened and I was like, this is crazy. And when I got back to KZN, I was, it wasn't nearly as bad as the guys in Joburg were telling me. And the reason was is because guys were sharing fake videos from other places of like uh, cars being moved down hills and stuff. It wasn't that it wasn't bad, it's just it was fake news that hyped the whole thing up. And so we don't, we know, and, and what we need to realize, and I believe we're all Christians here, and that is this sometimes freaks Christians out, but perception is reality. What I perceive to be true is what I believe is true is what I'm gonna do, and when we're in the media space, that is what takes place. And that's how, um, basically, Trump won, we think. <laughs> By the way, it's really interesting. There's a case study on Trump versus Clinton on that trust equation. If, you're interest, inter, if that equation interested you, go and read it because theoretically, if, according to that equation, Trump establishes more trust with his, with his uh, user base than Clinton did because he was way more intimate, which is a bit dodge, but anyway. Um, the, the other thing is people trust people, not organizations, and we can engage with people uh, with these spaces so that people connection is more important, which means that there's value in profiling people like editors and tastemakers and curators and show hosts. The social media presence and size and ability to affect the change and influence of their audience is important when you're in broadcasting because this is a key, but we need to be able to bring this into magazines, into um, all the stuff we used to do to make great content, bringing people in from all over the place. That stuff works here because those people build your brand. Start to look at creating experiences that people can bring their friends to. Gagasi FM have just released a strat strategic uh, mandate that as a radio station, they're now more built around building experiences than they are about building content for radio. And if you look at all the great radio stations that are doing great things at the moment, they're more focused on what they're doing out in the community than they are about the content that's actually happening on their radio station. The radio station is, in for, is, is uplifting the stuff that they're doing outside. Find ways to involve your customer in your content and you will start to build trust in them. And I'm gonna cl start closing up now with this comment on intelligence. This is the more complicated one to wrap our heads around. But let me put it like this. In context, we use sensors and devices to gather data that tell us something about you. What we now want to be able to do is make decisions based on that data that we have. And we need to start becoming intelligent with this data. And so intelligence graduates data to action-based intelligence. And this is, a, this is a difficult one because you need some infrastructure here. You need to understand how this world fits together and it's, it's, I don't have enough time to unpack it completely. But what I'm saying is it's not enough to just have the information. You have to have infrastructures in place to turn that information into decisions that improve either your customers' lives or your businesses' and, uh, structure. The beauty of this is you can do it on a macro level and you can do it on a micro level on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis, depending on how you do this. Intelligence is about en enhancing that contextual data that we found and linking it with the stuff we own, the stuff we know, the third-party stuff we can access, etc. It's about understanding new trends, it's finding opportunity, it's about building triggers off the stuff we have now find that then creates actions off the back of it. And the beauty is, is that we can automate a lot of that, which is great because we're getting lazy. In media, there's two things, and they both revolve, revolve around Netflix. The one is simple. The one is the fact that Netflix uses what you watch to be able to recommend other content, and it just keeps you engaged in that content. But there's something else that they do. You know that Net Netflix has a full original series where they create all their own original content. And the reason they're doing that is because they understand that that's the only value that, that people are going to eventually come back to 
with that. And they're about to have one of the biggest competitors on the market hit, the, hit that platform because Disney is about to release its version of Netflix, which means that it's going to pull all of the Disney content. It owns Fox News, it owns Miramax, it owns uh, Pixar and Disney. All of that content is only going to be accessible through Disney's channel. And so if, if, if these subscription services don't have original content that draw people in, they're not going to survive that change. Okay, so that's what's happening. But they're using a really interesting thing. They've analyzed all of the movie content that's out there and they've built a formula of what makes a great movie. And so you submit your script for that movie into Netflix's engine and it automatically spits out whether you got it or didn't. Because they have a formula that creates great movies. And they've done that based on all the data that they've got around what, what, what great movies look like. So how do we go about thinking about the future of this work? And let me just put this to you. When I say the future of this work, it takes 18 months for the average organization to execute a strategy or a strategic decision. I am not including in that time frame the time it takes to make that strategic decision. If you've ever sat around a board table, you will know that sometimes twice as long. Okay? There's a reason why big organizations acquire small companies, because it's quicker to get ahead than to try and get the business to turn on its heel. Okay? And so why we, why, what I want to say when I talk about this, how we need to think, is it's how you need to think tomorrow. Because the chances are you're only going to get this off the ground in 18 months, if you can make a decision today. And so we don't have time to waste here. Because when, whatever you start deciding to do, it's going to take time to happen. <coughs> so the first thing you need to understand is content is still king. It's still there. What I like to remind people is just remember there's an entire chessboard with other pieces on. So there's other things that we can do. We don't just keep plugging content. Technology is not your competitive edge. It's your accelerator. You've got to work out what your competitive edge is first. And then you, then you stand on that accelerator as hard as you can. Data will enable your future business value. But, and I don't have time to share this model with you, data is not your competitive edge. Okay, so data isn't what's going to make you brilliant. It's what you do with that data to enhance what makes you brilliant that's going to give you the edge in the future. It's not about becoming digital. It's about learning to succeed in a digital age. You do not have to chase every single new piece of technology, be on the edge of every new thing, buy the latest phone, etc. You don't have to do that. What you need to do is understand how the digital world works and how to engage with it. And you engage with it by understanding context, relationship, and intelligence. So I'm going to share this, and then I'm done. I believe that we need to start thinking differently. And in order to do well in digital, we need to get different kinds of people around the table to see the opportunities. So the first is you need to start to think like an entrepreneur. Stop trying to sell something and start building value, because that will add long-term value to your business. You need to start thinking like a marketing brand visionary. In other words, you need to think emotively, how does this change people? How am I going to get people to change what they currently do in order to do what I need them to do to keep my business alive? Because there's an emotive conversation here in the human aspect that's way more important than how many clicks to the website that I walk through to get a sale. We have to find ways to move people. Think like an influencer. Build your network and then leverage that community. That community is your asset. It's a difficult asset, but it's your asset. And you need to learn how to leverage it. Think like a salesperson. Generate cash first. Business is about making money. You will never prove your business concept in digital, your marketing concept in digital, unless it makes you money in the short term. Because people will can it before you realize the long-term value. Because it is a cost center until it realizes its value. 
So look for the opportunities to drive cash into your projects as quick as possible. Think like a profit. A little bit different to the, type, to the word profit that we normally use, but think about this. Small teams move faster. Big teams break down uh, big ideas. You, small teams are really good at executing on big ideas. And the, one of the reasons is because there's a leader in that team that is really good at, at, at passing on the vision of that team and keeping people focused and passionate about what they're doing. And so think like a profit. Think like an API. An API, very simply, is like a little translator. It's a little black box that sits between one set of code and another set of code. And all it does is it translates information and allows company A to access the information that company B lets it access, and vice versa. In other words, we're making sharing easy. And so when, when you think like an API, you need to build business models that protect your core and interface with everything else and share as much as possible on everything else, but protect your core. And then finally, think like a rebel. Chart your own course. There's a beautiful study that's going on at the moment with some consultants where they're going against the idea of best practice. When you study management and marketing and consulting and all of these things they teach you, what is the best practice? What's been done before? How do we make this work? What's going to definitely happen? What's the problem with doing best practice? Anyone? Everybody does it. So we're just doing it like everybody else did it. You're not going to stand out. You're not going to break through. You're not going to stand out and, and, and do something that's different and new and exciting for your customers, which means they're going to be bored, which means you're going to be a commodity, which means once you're a commodity, what's the only thing you can do? Cut your price. And we can't play a price game, not in this economy. We can't play a price game because we're running out of margin. So we have to find other ways of being able to make this work. Think like a rebel. Chart your own course. Find your own way to what you're looking for to do. So finally, last slide, I promise. Nerdin's checking me out. He's like, you're done, like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Make your voice heard in a digital world means meeting them in their context, tra building trust and relationship, unlocking intelligence to provide a more convenient and useful tools for, and communications for your customers. I've got two books that I've written in the back. One's on my entrepreneurial journey, the five-year mark, and the other one is, um, it talks a lot about this thinking, but specifically applied into how to build relationship and a platform to build your businesses off of, um, called Renowned. It's about online personal branding. You can get them at the back. They're normally 250 in, in store. Um, you can buy both at 400. On that note, it's a little marketing plug. You can get in touch with me. Please do. Best way is through social media, not email. <laughs> I'm just shocking on email. Um, but you're welcome to email me. You will get a response, but it might be in about three weeks' time. Um, but thank you. You guys have been fantastic. <laughs>